And myth number two that we need to dispel is this other figure who lived at the same time as the Baal Shem Tov, who's Moses Mendelssohn. Okay, so Moses Mendelssohn, you hear the name, everybody starts to cringe, because in the Orthodox world, he's like public enemy number one almost, because he's considered like the, found, the, the start of the reformers and the uh, Haskalah, the, the Jewish Enlightenment, and he started the whole thing of Jews assimilating and converting out, and he's blamed for all these things. And the reality is that Moses Mendelssohn actually, in his day, wasn't such a bad guy. It might be shocking to hear, but uh, he was not the founder of reform. He is credited with kind of starting the Haskalah because he did study philosophy. He did become famous among even the Germans and the, the non-Jewish world as a great philosopher and a great thinker. Uh, but he actually produced the first translation of the Torah into the common language, German, which was called the Bi'ul, and he gave commentary from Talmud, from Midrash. It was a strictly like rabbinic commentary, and it was a bestseller. People loved the book, and it was great. And it got a skamot from many, many rabbis. The Khatam Sofer would be the one that started to basically proclaim the ban on all of Mendelssohn, anything to do with Mendelssohn. But that was in the next generation. In the generation of Mendelssohn, people actually thought really highly of him. And he did a lot for... Right, let's see. So let's see how that happened. In his generation, he was actually very highly admired and respected. We even have his letters that he, his correspondence with Rav Yaakov Emden, who was another one of the Gedolim at that generation, the Yavetz. And they refer to each other very respectfully. Moses Mendelssohn says, I'm your student, I'm thirsty for your Torah. And interestingly enough, the Yavetz, Rav Yaakov Emden, tried to stop, as we'll see, study of the Zohar. And he, wrote, he famously wrote against the Zohar because he wanted to discourage people from studying it, and we'll see why soon. But Moses Mendelssohn was the opposite. He defended the Zohar as, no, this is a legit text that was from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and that we should study it. So interestingly enough, he was like a defender of traditional Judaism and a defender of the rabbinic tradition, Moses Mendelssohn. Rav Yaakov Emden, I'm throwing out a lot of names, but you're going to have to try to <laughs> Rav Yaakov Emden, I don't know if you know this, but at that time in the 1700s, had a huge controversy with Rav Yonatan Eibeshutz. These two had a big, because Rav Yaakov Emden was accusing Rav Yonatan Eibeshutz of being a heretic, and they f were head to head with each other. What's interesting though is, even though Rav Yaakov Emden and Rav Yonatan Eibeshutz were opposed to each other, they both were very respectful of Moses Mendelssohn, and they both actually liked Moses Mendelssohn. They all lived at the same time. It's actually amazing that in this period, in the 1700s, all these people overlap. It's amazing to stop and think for a second. All these people live at the same time. The Baal Shem Tov, Moses Mendelssohn, Rav Yaakov Emden, Rav Yonatan Eibeshutz, not only that, but the Vilna Gaon, and the Ramchal lived at this time, and in the Sephardi world, the Chida and the Rashash, all these great figures lived at the same time. It's amazing. In general, Kabbalah has three movements. Some say four, but it's really three movements. There's the Hasidic stream, which, is the, which was founded by the Baal Shem Tov. And then there's the more Mizrahi Sephardi style, which was attributed to the Rashash. And then there is the more European non-Hasidic style, which is a blend of the Vilna Gaon and the Ramchal. Some people separate, distinguish between them, usually just put them together. So you have three streams of, of the Arizal's Kabbalah really split into three in the 1700s. And they all lived at the same time. All these people are contemporaries of each other, which is amazing that all these things are happening simultaneously. So the myth, the second myth to dispel is that Moses Mendelssohn was some evil person out to destroy Judaism, which is completely not true. He was very much in line with the rabbinic tradition and defended the rabbinic tradition and was highly respected in his day. And none of these people said bad things about him, by the way. The Vilna Gaon said all kinds of things about the Hasidim. We know that they were opposed to the Hasidim, but they never said anything bad about Moses Mendelssohn, right? And they lived at the same time period. So it's only in the following generation. So today you hear all these silly stories about Moses Mendelssohn, which are completely not true, right? Like to try to portray him in a negative light. So it's important to, to, to remember that because you'll hear that in the future. Somebody telling a story about Mendelssohn that's like way off, that like makes no sense, as if he was this like evil, he had some evil plans to f destroy Judaism or something. Uh, but it's not true. So that's the second myth that we need to dispel. Why did he become uh, such a big enemy? 
because in the following generations, as this Haskalah, this Jewish enlightenment spread, and people saw him as kind of the, found, the first person to start the Jewish enlightenment, he became associated with that. His own children converted to Christianity. Out of his six kids, four or five converted to Christianity, and his grandkids were all basically eventually well, that's, that's Christian. Wrong, yeah, so you see the result. It must be more than just the translation that he did there. His translation, again, was very much in line. It was a very traditional translation and commentary. But something's off. It was because he encouraged study, secular studies also and received secular studies himself. But that was no different than anybody else. Like Rav Yaakov Emden. Is that wrong to, to... No, no. Rav Yaakov Emden also encouraged it. They have a Torah education? Yeah, yeah. He said you need both. Yeah, he went to yeshiva. Moses Mendelssohn had a yeshiva education. The children, that's already, I don't know what happened to them. But he started, he became very famous among the, you know, hanging out with the German nobility. So you can imagine what happened to the kids, you know. It was more like the socializing with the Germans that inspired the kids to become German, essentially. Remember, at that time, it was still, you couldn't be a citizen if you were Jewish. You couldn't be a professor, a doctor. There's all these jobs that were barred if you were Jewish. So these people didn't convert because they saw the light of Christianity. They converted just to be accepted in society. That's all it was. So in his day, he wasn't opposed. In his day, actually, the opposition was against the Hasidim. We know that there was huge opposition against the Hasidim, excommunications mm-hmm. against them. And once the Hasidim became acceptable, the, the attention shifted to Mendelssohn and the reformers. Right? So the, the opposition shifted from Hasidut to reform and all these other... So um, reform didn't start with Mendelssohn. But his ideas, again, his philosophy led to others wanting to take up secular studies, learn philosophy, compare Judaism to other religions. And then people like Abraham Geiger came around. And Geiger is the one who's really considered the father of Reformed Judaism. And he wanted to make Judaism like a religion, not a nation so much, but like specifically a religion that could be for anybody. So he wanted to detach Judaism from Israel, from the Holy Land, from the Temple. Right? So Reform started to call their Beth Knesset a temple because they abandoned the idea of believing in Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem, and the rebuilding of... This is a temple, right? The, the Beth Knesset is your temple. So they abandoned the belief in, a, in believing in Mashiach, in a rebuilding of the temple, all these things, and they said we should speak German. They started to change the services into German, get, uh, edit the Sidur, make it easier, make it simpler. In some places, they moved Shabbat to Sunday, because the Christians go to church on Sunday. So we'll go with them. We'll go to synagogue on, on Sunday. So they did all these things to be like Germans, essentially, right. as opposed to um, Jews. So, and, and Geiger's the one who said the Talmud's got to go. So the Talmud is basically just a cultural text for us. That's all. Like, it's just studied like a history book. It has no actual meaning. Halacha is not binding anymore. So that's the difference between reform and conservative and orthodox, is that reform holds that halacha is not binding. If you want, you can do it. It's traditions. It's like pick and choose what you like. If you like it, do it. If not, though, you don't have to do anything. And the first synagogue that really started to adopt this was in 1810. Actually, Abraham Geiger was born in 1810. That same year, there was an Orthodox synagogue that caused a stir because they started to do certain prayers in German. And that was the big deal in 1810. And it took another 30 years for that synagogue to slowly, then they start to add music, bring a choir, you know, slowly, slowly. Uh, and this is, again, long after Mendelssohn and the Baal Shem Tov and the Vilna Gon. This is already the 1800s. Right? 